the sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praises He hears faith There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray
In 2020, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of uh, working with our volunteer team to run Inner West Mainly Music, both online and face-to-face. In 2021, I was wondering whether you had considered whether you might like to serve on our volunteer team. Mainly Music is all about coming alongside families and children as they take the journey of parenthood and grandparenthood and caringhood. There's singing and music and dancing and jumping and toys and crafts and there's setting up and there's packing away and there's playing with kids and generally having a lovely nurturing time showing families the love of Jesus. Perhaps you would like to be involved on our volunteer team. Inner West Mainly Music is on Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. Perhaps you can spare a couple of hours on a Thursday morning. Perhaps you can spare a really big chunk of time on a Thursday once a month. Perhaps you can do something that's in between. I would love to hear from you if you're interested in joining our volunteer team. Please send me an email. My email is tiffany at willychurch.org.au. I look forward to hearing from you. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Church Online. It's great to be together today and to be gathering in this way to be the church, to be equipped to uh, live out our faith and our discipleship to Jesus in our everyday lives. It's so wonderful that you have joined us and this morning we are um, in for a really uh, great treat because today we have a guest speaker joining us here on Church Online. Graham Joseph Hill is the principal of Stirling Theological College in Melbourne, which is a Church of Christ college um, and most recently has uh, written a book called Hide This In Your Heart. Um, all around the theme of memorizing the Bible and putting scripture to memory. Graham has been a long time advocate of the spiritual practices, the things that we put in place in our lives to experience God and to meet with God and to be transformed by his word and his presence. And um, one of the, the spiritual practices that he has been passionate about is memorizing the Bible, which is why he's written this book, Hide This in Your Heart. And so Graham's message today really comes out of that book and is based on the teachings of that book. Um, and uh, really, we're going to be looking today at, you know, what does it mean to be the people of God who are formed by God's word, who immerse ourselves in God's word? So we're really blessed to be hearing this message this morning. Um, if you're interested in Sterling Theological College, if you'd like to find out more about how you might go deeper in your faith in learning more about the Bible or pastoral care or counselling or um, theology, then you can check out Sterling's website, Sterling uh, College, um, their website and their Facebook and so on. They would love to, to connect with you if you're interested. Uh, in finding out more. I know I've done study at Sterling and it's an incredible place of learning uh, and being formed as a disciple. If you are joining us for the first time today, we would love you to join um, uh, in by filling our connect card out. It's on our website at willychurch.org.au slash connect. Uh, we read every single connect card and we respond to every single person who has been filling out those cards um, over 2020 and into 2021. So we would love you to do that if you're joining us for the first time or maybe one of the first times this morning. So let's be encouraged this morning as we hear from Graham Joseph Hill, as we worship together um, and, um, and other church together, let's be really encouraged this morning.
Recently, Michael Frost and I wrote a book called Hide This in Your Heart, which is about memorising scripture in order to have a passionate, radical, devotional, prayerful, world-changing Christian life. This book has lots of resources in it, including some memory cards, so that you can begin to focus on what does it mean to be God's person, inspired by scripture to follow Jesus wherever he might take you in life. And today I thought it might be good for us to look at Psalm 119, verse 11, where the title of this book comes from. Michael Frost and I have called this book, Hide This in Your Heart. And Psalm 119, verse 11 says these words, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In fact, Psalm 119, if you were to paraphrase, it would be about what does it mean to hide God's word deeply in your heart? so that you can live a blameless and pure life, so that you can live a life that is full of prayer and devotion, so that your life can be one that is radical, activistic, prophetic, and makes a great difference in the world. Psalm 119 is about the psalmist's passion for God, his desire for God to change and transform his life, and his commitment to the idea that God reveals God's self through the words of Scripture, and shapes our lives so that our lives make a difference in the world. And so today I want us to look at Psalm 119, verse 11, and 2 Timothy 3 as well, and ask what does it mean to hide God's word in our heart? How does that change our lives and make us passionate for Jesus Christ, passionate for his gospel, passionate for mission, and passionate for transforming the world? When I first became a Christian, I was committed to all kinds of radical things. I remember I became a Christian in my late teens and it was a radical conversion to Jesus Christ. And my mates and I would spend time in all night prayer meetings. We would fast regularly. But I've noticed recently how some of that early passion for Jesus has died away. And as I begin to read the Psalms and pray about what does it mean to live a passionate spiritual life, the Psalms have reminded me that spiritual enthusiasm, desire for God, passion for his word, a commitment to being connected with God and enlivened in every area of our lives in order to proclaim God's news to the world is normal. I mean, listen to the words of the Psalms. The Psalmist says things like, as the deer longs for streams of living water, so my soul longs for you. My soul thirsts for you. I earnestly seek after you. My soul desires you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. The psalmist says, This one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on his beauty and to seek him in his temple. The psalmist says, My eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I might meditate on your promises. And C.S. Lewis says, this is the psalmist's hunger for God. In fact, Lewis says to call this the psalmist's love for God or desire for God is not quite strong enough. Lewis says the psalmist hungers for God. He yearns for God with every part of his being. And in Psalm 119, he says that it's the word of God, living and active and powerful in his spirit, that drives his desire for God, that shapes a pure and blameless life, that gives him an orientation towards God that really makes a difference in the world, a radical, activistic, prophetic, world-changing life. And when I think about my early days of Christianity, I wonder, where did my passion for God go? When did I stop 
praying all night? When did I stop weeping for the lost? When did my eyes become dry, my heart cold, my prayers devoid of their passion? When did I lose something of my passion for God that was present in my early days of Christian faith? Now, I don't want to beat myself up too much because I think one of the normal progressions in Christian faith is a a deepening maturity and a deepening sense that passion for God is expressed in more than one way. But I will say that one of the problems in Christian life is that sometimes we lose some of our passion for God and for faith that we had in the early days. And today I just want to share that I believe that hiding God's word in your heart, letting God's word become internalised and deeply within your spirit, that it begins to shape who you are, it begins to shape your desire for God, it begins to shape your orientation in life. And it's those who are passionate for God and committed to God's word that make a radical and significant difference in life, difference in the church and difference in society. When do we become afraid of passion in this spiritual life? In 1746, Jonathan Edwards, one of the greatest American theologians of his era, at least, and probably of all time, wrote a book called The Religious Affections. Now, that's an old fashioned way of talking about being spiritually passionate. And Jonathan Edwards said that one of the chief works of Satan is to promote the idea that spiritual enthusiasm and passion is something to be afraid of, something to be guarded against. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, remember, he was a great theologian, so he was a man of the mind, but he said, just as there is no true Christian faith where there is nothing but passion and enthusiasm, so too there is no true Christian faith where there is no enthusiasm for God. He said, if the great things of the gospel of Jesus Christ are apprehended fully and comprehensively, how can they not enliven the spirit? How can they not make us passionate? After all, we have a gospel that changes the world, the defining story of all of human history. How can it not make us passionate for God and passionate for his word? I believe that hiding God's word in your heart enlivens our spiritual life, restores our spiritual passion. And I think there are three things for us to understand as we consider this. The first one is this, as I've suggested, God wants your faith to be alive and passionate. And this comes through all through scripture, not just in the Psalms. So Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says, be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Or Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, but now what does the God require of you that you would love him and serve him and desire after him with all of your heart and all of your soul? Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 5 says, hear what the Lord our God would say. Love the Lord your God with all of your might and with all of your heart. In fact, when you look through scripture and it describes what is the spiritual life like, it often paints analogies that are about almost like physical analogies, like wrestling with a strong opponent, running a race, warring against a city. And all of the analogies that are painted in Scripture about the spiritual life are analogies about full physical, spiritual, intellectual exertion. It's about giving yourself fully to God and what God would do in the world. Now imagine if you're going to the Olympic Games and you're a Greco-Roman wrestler and you're going to come up against a 300-pound Russian wrestler. His eyes are bloodshot. His hair's covered. His back is covered in hair. You can tell all he wants to do is just rub your face into the mat. At that very moment, you think to yourself, I wish I had prepared a little bit more for this physical contest. In Scripture, the spiritual life is described as a contest as a activity of great exertion where you don't want to go in half prepared. You don't want to go in half hearted. The lackadaisical, the half hearted, those who are kind of ho hum about the spiritual life will not survive this spiritual battle and will not make a deep impact on the world. And so the Bible uses all sorts of analogies that draw our attention to this very fact. So what do we do about that? Well, I think we need to press into the Holy Spirit 
It's not by might, nor by power, nor by my own will or my own determination or efforts that I'll get that I'll become spiritually passionate and follow Jesus. It's by the grace of God, the power of God in the spiritual life. Life is one is an experience that knocks you around. I'm a body surfer and I'll regularly go out into the ocean and swim and I turned 50 a couple of years ago and my family remind me that I'm getting old, that I'm a fossil. And they often say to me, you know what, Dad or Graham, don't keep putting yourself in danger when you go out into the ocean. You're not as young as you once were. You're not as fit as you once were. You're getting old. Don't put yourself in a situation of danger. But I can't help myself. I'll often go out into the ocean and I'll be body surfing. And even though I'm a pretty good swimmer, there'll be occasions where I wonder whether I'm going to die. You know, those of you that have kind of uh, been involved in body surfing or surfing in great waves, know what the experience is like where you get smashed by a huge wave and you claw your way up through the water for air and another wave smashes you down and you claw your way up for air again and another wave smashes you down and you think to yourself, this is where I die. There's no hope for me in this moment. Somehow you get through, but you're not always sure that you will. Well, life can be like that. I regularly come across people where it looks like life has smashed them down. They claw up for air and another wave smashes them down. They claw up for air and you think, how is it that, that one person could go through so much suffering? Well, the Bible tells us that even though life can beat us, up, beat us up, can be difficult and painful, our hearts can be broken, our expectations can be shattered, we can struggle with relationships and career and all sorts of things. The Bible tells us that it's the presence of God, the power of God in our lives, God's presence, power, provision that sustain us, that allow us to maintain a passionate spiritual life regardless of what life might throw at us. The second thing I would say, so number one, God wants our faith to be passionate and alive and we often find the resources for that in the power of the Holy Spirit and by going into God's word. The second thing I would say is that consuming God's word restores our spiritual passion. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3 Verses 14 to 16 reminds us that the Bible does this. The first thing that Paul says to Timothy is, remember those who have gone before. The people that have gone before who've struggled for faith, who've loved God with all of their heart, who've given you an example of the spiritual life, remember those people and follow their example. In fact, Paul says in another place, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul says, remember those who've gone before and their love for God, their commitment to the gospel and their commitment to God's word. And then he says, remember that if you embrace scripture, it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That scripture is not man-made, but it's God-breathed. The origin of the Bible and its words come out of the very heart of God and they point us back to Jesus Christ and his gospel and his word. Scripture is living and active. It's God breathed. It's useful correct for correction and growth and rebuke and encouragement. Remember the power of God's word. And I'm, I'm stunned. You know, when you read the words of scripture, what do you discover? that the spiritual life is described in Scripture in very vivid terms. All sorts of words are used like fear and hope, hatred, joy, gratitude, compassion, so uh, sorrow, zeal. If we ever wondered whether the spiritual life is meant to be alive and vibrant, well, we only, only need to go into the, the passages of Scripture to see that that is the case. Uh, in 1990, I spent six months in India staying at a Bible college and studying with Indian students. And we'd be woken up at four o'clock in the morning. We'd go down and pray from 4.30 until seven o'clock. We'd spend our time in prayer before breakfast. Then we would study scripture. Then we'd go out doing evangelism and mission on the streets. And it was during those months of staying at a Bible college in India that I learned what passionate faith looks like. 
where I learned what it meant to start your day with hours of prayer, being immersed in God's word, pressing into God, and then discovering that biblical study and passionate Christian witness often emerges out of the power of scripture. My grandfather was a missionary to Sydney And when I was about 11 or 12, I would often stay at his house. And my grandfather ministered to the most broken people of Sydney. My grandfather became a Christian on a boat on the journey or a ship on the journey from Scotland. He became a Christian and was very committed to faith. And in the early days, he he became committed to the idea that God had called him to work amongst drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, the most poor and broken of the early Sydney colony. And when I was 11 or 12, I would stay in his house. And I still remember all sorts of people would be in my grandfather's house. It was an open home. The most broken and lost and rejected of society found a place where they could be loved and accepted in my grandfather's house. And one day when I was about 12, I remember staying in my grandfather's house and hearing the sound of sobbing. And I walked downstairs and there was my grandfather early in the morning, kneeling beside the couch, weeping over an open Bible. And he looked up at me with with his face covered in tears. And he said to me, Graham, whatever you do in life, don't stop going deeply into the word of God. It's in the word of God that you'll find the presence, the power, the passion and the provision that God has for you. He said, Graham, all of your days, love Jesus. Meet Jesus in his word and love the world for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's those moments that have a deep impression on you, don't they? That are a powerful impression on me. My grandfather taught me that love for God's word, that love for Jesus and love for the world, all of these things go hand in hand. So we're reminded that going into the word of God enlivens our spirit, renews our mind, enables us to combine a prophetic, radical, activistic faith with spiritual maturity as well, and helps us develop the kind of spiritual resources that are required to truly be God's people. Let me just talk about that for a moment. It's easy for us to be led astray in life. All of the the materialism, the consumerism, the desires of this age are always trying to get us to desire them, to love them and not to love Christ. I do a a lot of counselling with people and, and often with Christian leaders whose lives have fallen apart. And often it looks like they've had a, a sudden implosion. And you think, how did that Christian leader go from being someone who was an example of godliness to somebody whose life was broken and exposed in front of the whole world. And I think the analogy is like a, it's like a sinkhole syndrome. You know that, that, in a, that in America and other parts of the world, there, there are sinkholes that happen. And a sinkhole is where there's this great artesian lake under a part of the city. It dries up. And then the buildings that are built on that part of the lake collapse You know, the ground can't hold their weight anymore and they collapse in on themselves. And you discover that all of that building, all of that structure was built upon a hollow, vacuous, weak part of the land that was always going to collapse in on itself. And I think sometimes Christian life can be like that. Sometimes you'll see a Christian life fall apart, but what you discover was that for all of the externals, For all of the appearance of godliness and righteousness, there was nothing supporting it. There was nothing deep and rich and solid and godly underneath. But that's what prayer, that's what pressing into Christ, that's what the Word of God does. It builds a solid base and enables us to live a life that is able to weather the storms. I think the other thing that the Word of God does is it helps us to develop a kind of self-mastery. Remember that we're always being led by the devil, by the world, 
to kind of pursue and desire other things and to live lives that reflect the morality or the ethics of the world rather than the morality and the ethics of Christ and God's world, uh, word. There's a parable that I heard when I was travelling in Africa and it goes something like this. Once a great lion prowled through the jungle and when it would come across a lesser animal, it would look at that animal and say, who? Giraffe is the king of the jungle. And the giraffe would tremble and say, you, mighty lion, are the king of the jungle. The lion would prowl through the jungle doing this to every creature that came across. And one day it came across an elephant and said, who, elephant, is the king of the jungle? And the elephant, without saying a word, a word, wrapped its trunk around the lion's torso, lifted it off the ground and smashed it against the tree. And the lion, broken against the tree, looks up at the elephant and says, just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean you have to lose your temper. You know, often in Christian life, Christian leaders are tempted to dominate, control, impress, influence, intimidate when we're called to love, to serve, to exercise self-mastery, self-control, to be a people of humility and spiritual depth for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the word of God, for the sake of spiritual maturity. And we're all called to do that. Don't be tempted to the external life, to the exclusion or the loss of the deep inner life. The third thing I'd like to say is that Jesus empowers us. In fact, he's our example of the passionate life dedicated to God's word. It shouldn't escape our attention that when Jesus is under pressure, what does he do? He quotes scripture. And in fact, the Pharisees, there's, a, there's an occasion in scripture where the Pharisees try to trick him. They say to him, you know, Jesus, there are many occasions when somebody divorces and then they remarry. Now, when they go to heaven, who will they be married to? Was it the first husband or the second husband? And they're trying to trip Jesus up to see whether he really, they're trying to expose him as someone who doesn't really know the word of God. And Jesus looks at them and he says to them, your problem, religious leaders, is twofold. Firstly, you don't know the scriptures. And secondly, you don't know the power of God. Jesus says, if you knew God and you knew God's power, you would know the scriptures are not about legalism and regulations and rules. They're about life, about fullness of life, about freedom for people. God's word is given that we might have communion with God and that we might see the world transformed for the sake of the gospel. Your problem, religious leaders, is that you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. And then the, uh, the Sadducees are a bit annoyed. They've been embarrassed publicly. So they, they, they confer together. And then they say to Jesus, well, if you're so clever, what is the heart? What's the most important scripture? And Jesus says to them, well, it's this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. All of the commands... All of the words of scripture, all the promises of God are wrapped up in this. Love God and love your neighbour as you love yourself. Jesus says, if you knew God, God's power and God's word, you would know that. It's a message of liberation and hope and fullness. Jesus serves as our example and we see so many, so many instances where Jesus quotes scripture. He's in the desert He's being tempted and what does he do? He quotes scripture. He's challenged by adversaries and what does he do? He quotes and reframes scripture. He grew up in an environment where scripture became a part of his spirit and then knowing God, he lived that out fully. When we go to John chapter 11, uh, uh, John chapter uh, is 11 through to 16, we see Jesus constantly qu quoting scripture as he goes towards the cross as well. So what do we do with this? I say that what we should do is go to the gospels. I often say to people, take the 30 day gospel challenge. It sounds like an ad for a cereal or something, doesn't it? 
Take the 30-day gospel challenge. Go to the gospels and for 30 days, immerse yourself in the gospels and say, what does Jesus talk about? Who does he spend his time with? What does he love? What stirs up his energies? What is he passionate about? What breaks his heart? Go into the Gospels and see how does Jesus love God? How does he love the broken? How is he committed to God's word? And ask God to change your heart so that you'll be like him. I want to finish by looking at the words of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 are the words of the Spirit of God to the church in Laodicea. And often when we, when we quote these words, we quote them in evangelistic context, but in fact, they are words of the Spirit of God to the church of God. And they say this, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I want to spit you out of your mouth, out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, but you're poor. I'm clothed, but you're naked. I'm important, but you're not. Come to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I want to come in and I want to eat with you. I've con- I confess I've got a bit of a caffeine addiction. I think the two, when we get to heaven, there'll be streams of Coke Zero and streams of of coffee. And the problem is, you know, I've got a little bit of a problem, I know. I like to always have a a cold form of caffeine available to me, usually in the form of Coke Zero, which I think is a nectar of heaven, or a beautiful barista-made coffee available at all times. It's a bit of a problem, pray for me. And I think when we get to heaven, We won't drink water. We're going to drink Coke Zero and coffee. But here's the thing. Even Coke Zero, even Coke Zero, if you leave it in your car and it goes lukewarm, even that exquisite drink becomes foul. You know, when Coke Zero is lukewarm, it's disgusting. You want to spit it out of your mouth. Or even a beautiful coffee that's made by by the best barista, in the United States or Australia, and you drink it as lukewarm, it tastes foul, because those things that are meant to be cold should remain cold. Those things that are meant to be hot should be hot. It's lukewarm that is disgusting, distasteful, pollutant. It's lukewarm that you want to spit out of your mouth. The words of the Spirit of the church are, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but lukewarm. Not lukewarm. Anything but lukewarm. And the answer isn't trying harder, praying more, making some kind of an effort to be more spiritual. The answer is actually in the words to the Spirit of the Spirit of the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me come in, if you are earnest and repent, I will come in and eat with you. I will renew your spirit. I will enliven your heart. I will inspire your spiritual passion. I'll give you a new life, a new energy, a new desire for God, a new desire for for me, a new desire for the word. I believe with all of my heart that God wants us to have an alive spiritual passion And it comes by pressing into Jesus, relying on his grace, allowing the spirit to do a work in our lives and by hiding the word of God in our hearts. Not only that we might not sin against God, but that we might be pure, prophetic, passionate, prayerful and committed to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray today that you'd give us the desire, the courage, the commitment to lead radical, passionate, uncompromising lives, that we would be transformed nonconformists, 
who follow after Jesus Christ, who hide the word of God in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that you have been stirred up today and encouraged in your pursuit of, um, of knowing God and experience he, experiencing God through his word in scripture, um, as I have been um, inspired and stirred up also. Next week here on Church Online, we have another incredible uh, guest with us. I'm going to be interviewing Andrew Stark from Open Doors Australia. It's going to be a fascinating and inspiring interview where we're going to learn about Open Doors, but also hear Andrew's incredible story of how God has used him um, and his um, background in security now um, in the ministry of Open Doors. So don't miss Church Online next Sunday, the 24th. It's going to be wonderful and really inspiring. We are really hoping and planning to be relaunching our Sunday gatherings on Sunday, the 31st of January. In the meantime, we are um, having our whole chapel and our church office um, and the, the rooms to the side of the church chapel recarpeted. So we're going to be in touch with you over the coming week because we're going to need some volunteers to come down and help to bump out the chapel uh, with pews out and, and all the furniture out so that we can have that carpet laid. That carpet has been generously given to us um, by Bayview Church down in Mornington. So we're really blessed by that. And we're really looking forward to having our chapel look really fresh for our relaunch. But um, we will keep you posted through our e-news um, about how you can help and be part of um, just all of the, the practical things that we need to see happen so that we can have that carpet laid in the next couple of weeks. Um, looking forward to seeing you again next week on Church Online. Let me pray for us as we go. God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that we are a people of the book, that we are a people who look to you and to, to your word to guide our lives, to anchor us, um, to inform our lifestyles and our choices. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just go with us now into our week so that we could be your light, um, that we could bring your light into our communities this week, into our workplaces, into our relationships. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And this mountain that's in front